Hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this evening's Artist and in Inspiration program. I'm Christine Pompo. I'm the School Programs Manager here at the Adirondack Experience. I would like to start this evening's program by acknowledging that the Adirondack Experience is situated on the Aboriginal territories of the Mohawk and Abenaki communities. Indigenous people continue to live in this region and practice their teachings and life ways. Next summer, the museum will be opening our permanent artist and inspiration exhibit. Construction is underway. Check for project updates on our website and on social media. This monthly speaker program focused on the topics and artists that will be featured in the exhibition will be continuing into next year. So we hope you tune in. Tonight, I am delighted to introduce Claudia Pfeiffer, Deputy Director and Head Curator at the National Sporting Library and Museum in Middleburg, Virginia. Ms. Pfeiffer has curated over 30 exhibitions at the museum over the last 10 years. Before her work at the museum, she was the director of the Hardcastle Gallery in Delaware and served as director at Red Fox Fine Art in Middleburg. Ms. Pfeiffer has studied biology and English at the University of Delaware. Throughout this evening's presentation, please feel free to submit any questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Thank you for joining us and I will turn it over to you, Claudia, thank you. I wanted to start out by thanking the Adirondacks, Adirondacks experience for the opportunity to participate in the Artists and Inspiration Lecture Series. We at the National Sporting Library Museum had the privilege of receiving loans from your collection for two of our past exhibitions, A Field in America, 400 Years of Animal and Sporting Art in 2011, and Side by Side with Gun and Dog in 2016. Much of the research for this talk comes from these two projects. I was excited for the excuse to go through the collection's database and focus on your sporting art holdings. I've selected approximately 60 images and organized them chronologically to help develop an, un an understanding of the emergence of Adirondacks art and sporting culture. We begin in 1842 with a watercolor by John William Hill in the tradition of the artists, naturalists, and explorers who documented the flora and fauna of the United States. The untitled work of a raccoon is from 1842, and it was reproduced in a book written by James E. Decay called Natural History of New York, Part One, Zoology. It depicted the variety of wildlife indigenous to the state of New York at the time, and was completed four years before John James and James Woodhouse Audubon's famed The Viviparous Quadrupeds of North America, which was released in, <clears throat> excuse me, 1846. Adirondack art has its roots in the development of American art as a unique genre. Arthur Fitzwilliam Tate was a famous among the most, excuse me, Arthur Fitzwilliam Tate was among the most famous early artists to attain success. He was, however, not born in the United States, but arrived here in 1850 from England, where he had had difficulties breaking into sporting art circles. He came at an opportune time when the American art movement was beginning to take shape. He quickly made a name for himself with scenes like this, which idealized the outdoors, life of the wealthy, the gentleman farmer, the trapper, and the frontiersman. Sporting art representations of horse racing, wing shooting, and fly fishing across Britain and Europe had already been depicted for two centuries. The development of American art added variety to the compositions and a fresh perspective to sporting art. The Adirondacks in particular held an allure for its impressive vistas and abundant sport. Many of Tate's paintings were reproduced as prints for an audience that celebrated and aspired to the outdoor life. In Tate's painting, Fishing Through the Ice, 1854, shown here, is Thomas Barber. He was a well-known hunter and fisherman of the era. Shooting for sport was not restricted to the upper classes in the United States. 
legally or in practice. The game laws in many states created a gunning culture that was markedly different from Great Britain. Namely, regulations did not focus around who was allowed to hunt and where, but rather centered on the claim of the shot. The taking game became the property of the individual who pulled the trigger, whether or not someone else had started to target the quarry first. This admittedly led to some conflicts, but it underlined the individual rights in which American, American sentiment is grounded. On one side of the debate was the sportsman. On the other side were individuals gunning for sustenance and market gunners who were mass harvesting birds for commercial profit. In this painting, Still Hunting on the First Snow, A Second Shot, 1855, by Tate, it is believed that he depicted himself firing the shot in the scene with early photographer Matthew Brady looking on. The true sportsman came to represent strong codes of ethics that placed an emphasis on healthy exercise, ethical conduct, restraint, and a kinship with nature. He was a well-read and took to heart the previous generation's writings such as American Dottie's Cabinet of Natural History and American Rural Sports, written in 1830. In it, he encouraged hunters to be satisfied with a moderate quantity of game and not to be ambitious to destroy life for the sake of making a parade of his success. Further, the ethical sportsman placed great value in breeding and keeping well-trained gun dogs. In Louis Moore's print titled Camping Out, some of the right sort, unquote, we, were, we see representations of this ideal in the scene. A variety of sporting clubs were started by like-minded sportsmen to actively promote stricter game laws and interstate law enforcement and establish game preserves. Here shown are members of such a club in 1856. Frederick Rondell, the artist, was another immigrant to attain success in New York City. This painting of Lake Placid, Essex County, New York Rock, is by American artist Augustus Rockwell. He was a member of the Walton Club in Brown's Tract and was noted in the Syracuse Standard newspaper of July 27, 1859 as an accomplished artist. And he was noteworthy enough to be recorded leaving for the notable fishing grounds in the Adirondacks. Here's a detail of the scene showing a camp at water's edge. By the 1870s, gunning had become one of the most popular middle-class participatory sports in the country. And Tate's paintings were in wide circulation as lithographs created and mass marketed by Courier and Ives. This Adirondack scene again shows Tate himself holding a rifle and calling to the moving canoe with a foxhound at his side. A hanging buck is in the background. It was reproduced under the title, American Hunting Scenes, An Early Start. In many ways, Tate was the personification of the American dream. The highly detailed conversation piece, A Good Time Coming, 1862, is his own shanty on Constable Point in Racket Lake. It offers a realistic snapshot of the dress, amenities, equipment of the well-to-do urban working class vacationing in the Adirondacks during this era. Homer Dodge Martin was an American born and trained student of the Hudson River School. In the 1860s, he spent summers sketching the Adirondacks, Catskills and White Mountains and returned to his studio in New York City to paint them. And here's an example of such a scene. In it, two anglers are shown heading to water's edge with long fishing rods over their shoulders. In this scene, a temporary encampment is presented in 1875 with two men returning from fishing with their day's catch at left and others at right with a taken deer. George Lafayette Clough 
was a Hudson River painter from Auburn, New York. He started out as a portraitist, but then began painting landscapes inspired by a trip to Europe. He first visited the Adirondacks in the 1860s and started painting realistic scenes such as this one of sportsmen in the camp. Here is an 1865 depiction of a lean-to with the camping equipment in the foreground. Once again, we, we return to the works of Arthur Fitzwilliam Tate. Here he took a realistic and unflinching approach to a dead black deer, uh, excuse me, dead black bear, reminiscent of artist naturalist compositions. Sportsmen responded to accuracy in artwork and a keen understanding of animal anatomy led to more realistic compositions. Beginning in 1864, Arthur Patton was another artist to keep a studio in New York City. He made his first trip to the Adirondacks in 1866, and he then regularly returned to there to the Catskills and to paint. Levi Wells Prentice grew up on a farm in Lewis County, New York. By 1872, he also had traveled through the Adirondack Mountains, painting the views as well as the surrounding region. He opened his first studio as a landscape painter in Syracuse, New York in 1875. Here's a typical example by Samuel A. Kilburn. His artistic career centered around still lifes of fish in natural settings. Before the days of photography, these two-dimensional trophies captured the luster of freshly caught fish and were popular among sportsmen. Born in Holland, Ferdinand Elwert Alexander Wust is another immigrant who attained success as an artist after moving to New York. He is best known for his landscapes of the Adirondacks, Catskill Mountains, and the Mohawk Valley in New York State. Here is a detail of early morning in the Adirondacks, the successful hunter 1873. It portrays a successful hunter returning to camp with mallards over his shoulder and two gun dogs at his side while a fellow camper is tending to a fire. Here's another striking painting by Arthur Fitzwilliam Tate, a portrait of an otter having caught a brown trout, which he recorded as having seen in Long Lake, New York. Tate's abilities as a painter were unerringly un informed by his observations of wildlife in their natural habitat. A sensitive pencil watercolor study of a gun dog from 1879 reveals Tate's observations recorded on paper. Scenes such as this continued to capture Tate's imagination for decades after he started his career. Here two sportsmen, one with a rifle at the ready, approach a buck and doe in the distance. There's a sense of balance between their tension and the bright fall tree line. Variations on a theme abounded in Tate's work. This popular subject here titled Good Hunting Ground from 1881 reflects his idyllic vision as a hunter of a beautiful landscape replete with plentiful deer, rabbits and ducks for the taking. Again, Tate reminds us of his observations as a sportsman. It is another popular subject of which he painted several variations, capturing a setter motionless on point, signaling to the location of a male and female ruffed grouse behind a rock in the foreground.
Frederick Sackrider Remington is most famously known for his Western bronzes, but he was a talented painter as well. He was born in Canton, New York, and began camping at Cranberry Lake in the Western Adirondacks in his teens. His painting of Albert Thompson's cabin captured the first year round dwelling in Silver Lake. This is another painting by Remington. Early in his career, he worked as an illustrator for Harper's Weekly. This painting, En Grisaille, French for In Gray Tones, was reproduced in the May 24th, 1890 issue with the title, Spring Trout Fishing in the Adirondacks, an odious comparison of weights. In the comical scene, five men are intent on finding out who caught the largest fish. The subject of this self-portrait, John Howard Doig, was born in New York in 1847. In it, he captured the essence of a turn of the century fisherman catching a large fish in heady waters. In D.L. Walker's painting from 1890, we see the first depictions of sportswomen in the presentation. After the Civil War, there was a great increase in tourism to the Adirondacks with the completion of the rail line there in 1871, making the area more accessible. Also, William Henry Harrison Adirondack Murray wrote the best-selling book, Adventures in the Wilderness or Camp Life in the Adirondacks in 1869. In it, he outlined the healthy benefits of the region and a primer on what it would take to wear and to, what to take and to wear while vacationing in the area. In it, he noted that women gained a hearty appetite on trips to the Adirondacks. He wrote, it is marvelous what benefit physically is often derived from a trip of a few weeks to these woods. I have known delicate ladies and fragile schoolgirls to whom all food at home was distasteful and eating a pure matter of duty, average a gain of a pound per day for the round trip. A contemporary, Joel Tyler Headley, wrote in the same year in his revised edition, The Adirondacks or Life in the Woods, that there was a class of women who wanted to, quote, rough it like any man. They liked the tent life, the distant exploration, and the hunter's fare, and sometimes used his rifle or the sportsman's rod, willing to take the evil and good together, the wild scenery and wilder life, have a charm for them that makes them laugh at mosquitoes and the thousand little inconveniences to which they are subjected. Here's a detail of the painting showing the women in corseted dresses fishing from the bank and a canoe on the shore. A variety of camp scenes continued to beckon to artists. Studies of texture, dappled light, and shadow are seen in N.A. Morris camp on the Lower Saranac, 1891. Here a watercolor painting captures Burdick's Hunting Lodge at Queer Lake, 1901 by female artist Clara Goodyear. Watercolor had gained momentum in art as an easily transported medium to paint and plein air or out in the open. The movement towards building more permanent and sizable structures in the Adirondacks is seen in this painting. Baker Cottage Adirondacks, circa 1902, by James Henry Moser. It is certainly quite a large residence to be called a cottage. We turn our attention now to this hilarious composition showing a herd of deer jumping through an encampment. Presumably international tourists, the men are shown in traditional Bavarian hunting clothes. One of two pots on a brick stove has toppled over, spilling the water for the sausages being cooked. Two of the men are on the ground. One has spilled his drink, and next to him are a gun, his knife, hat, and hunting satchel. The third man, standing, uh, holds a bottle of spirits and a glass as if he's ready to make a toast. The cook is in the scene, is seen in the distance, flailing her arms in dismay.
This study from Nature is by Philip Russell Goodwin, a noted sporting artist and illustrator. At the time, Goodwin had been painting shooting, big game hunting, and angling subjects for years, as well as modeling several bronzes of animal subjects. His continuing fascination with painting what was in front of him is evident in this quiet study, Cranford Camp in Fir Trees, 1920. As well as Camp Trees, circa 1929, his loose, thick brush, stroke is, brush strokes emphasized the linear patterns he saw in the man-made structures and echoed in the tree line. And finally, the last one by Goodwin is Boathouse Camp circa 1920. It is only six by 10 inches and is an organized composition of color values, shapes, and textures ready for further interpretation on a larger scale. Jacob's Hunting, 1907, by T. Strebel, is of Albert Jacobs Sr. He owned Bonnie Bell Farm in the Adirondacks, a family vacation haunt for hunting and fishing. His grandson recalled the painting and is recorded in an oral history. In it, he said, in 1906, a car drove up to the house and Mr. Strebel introduced himself to my grandmother as an artist with paintings to sell. He showed her different Adirondack scenes and offered to paint in a family, offered to paint in a family member. My grandmother and her friends decided that this would be the perfect present for Al. They picked the scene of a deer hunt and my grandmother gave him a snapshot of her husband dressed for a trip to the city. Mr. Strebel drove off and returned later with the picture. It was a big success as a birthday surprise and hung in the den with all the family's hunting and fishing gear stuffed trophies and a big pool table, our favorite spot. I heard the story as I grew up. I never knew why my grandmother was my, why my grandfather was dressed so formally since that's not the way he dressed at the farm and certainly not for hunting. Either was the business suit in the snapshot or Mr. Strebel's European origin where the elite wore hunting suits which made him do him that way. Here's a delicate painting of a smallmouth bass. Some of the best smallmouth bass may be found in the Adirondacks. They prefer cool water and can be found in streams, rivers, and lakes. Black bass with a tuttle bug is by Lottie Tuttle. She invented the tuttle bug fishing lure and patented it in 1919. The lure is still available today. Here she is photographed holding a rifle, proudly standing beside a deer she took. Also in the photo is her husband, Orly Tuttle, who also captured, who also is standing next to a deer that he took. It's quite the couple's photo, I have to say. Another painting by Tuttle is a portrait of her daughter, Fern, from 1920, circa 1930. It's a fashionable equestrian portrait of the young lady in avant-garde yard purse. She was also a fisherwoman and accompanied her father and mother on an expedition to the Red River in 1918, from which they brought home over 100 brook trout. On the trip, they first fished with another new lure at the time called the devil bug. Herbert S. Cates painted the watercolor Hunter's Cabin, Roaring Brook, Adirondack Mountains, circa 1920s, of a log cabin in the forest. Another by him shows Brandreth Outlet Camp, Fork Lake. Brandreth Lake Outlet remains a great location for brook trout today. Artist Jonas Lee moved to the Adirondacks in 1922. 
And in 1928, he commissioned, uh, was commissioned by Francis P. Garvin to paint his great camp called Kill Care, shown here. As a summer vacation residence, it was an intriguing choice for Lee to paint it in winter. The white contrast and deep blue shadows playing over the snow against the mountainscape frame the compound of buildings beautifully. He sketched and made studies from nature in an unseasonably warm February 1930 and returned to his studio to complete this 30 by 45 inch painting. This quaint scene was created from the imagination of a Uriah Abraham Lawson entitled The Monarch of the Heron Race Number no. One, First Painting, 1933. The artist was 61 years old at the time and noted on the back of the canvas that he had, quote unquote, no lessons. Presumably, he meant no painting lessons. In it, he envisioned a noble heron taking aim from a canoe at a flock of herons over the overhead. Paul Branson's watercolor, Landscape with Hunter, Dog and Geese, circa 1935-45, is a vibrant study of fall foliage, a hunter, his dog, and geese in flight overhead. Here he created another version with a purple mountainscape in the distance, and his technique with watercolor is quite lovely. Another study of a cabin is seen here in the woods titled Trapper's Hut, Roaring Brook, 1941. The monochromatic composition is another study of shape, perspective, light, and shadow. The chimney rises from the right of the roof and tall trees obscure the back of the cabin and create shadows across the scene. By the 1940s, improvements of roads across the country and affordable vehicles made areas like the Adirondacks even more accessible to the middle class in the 20th century. In the road from Tupper Lake to Saranac Lake by Julius Delbos, four vehicles drive towards the mountains and the promise of a leisurely vacation. A fisherman's hat with flies attached to it, a fishing net and two fish and a rod in the foreground are evidence of the fly fisher not in the scene. It harkens back to the still lifes popularized in the latter quarter of the 19th century, but with a 20th century aesthetic. This painting was a gift of the artist in 1957. It shows what had become the familiar rhythm of the start of the hunting season. Preparation of the cabin for the upcoming months included the constant chopping, stacking, and seasoning of wood to burn in the cabin's wood stove. This life-size painting of Cedric Gates from 1975 is by Donald Gates. The snowy landscape echoes centuries past. The figure, a seasoned hunter with a shotgun under his arm, however, is solidly of the 20th century with his red and black jacket, knit red and blue hat, button flannel, belted pants, and beige boots, a, film, film, a familiar sight today. The art of fly fishing has captivated fishermen back to the 17th century and Isaac Walton's complete angler. The flies themselves are works of art. Here painted is one designed by Burdick and called Fox Whiskers. It's from 1981. Another one inscribed pheasant from 1982 takes inspiration from the elegant game birds with long feathers.
In this contemporary composition of Brook Trout by Rebecca Richman from 2004, she plays with abstraction in the reflections on the surface of the water, camouflaging the brook trout just below. And finally, here we come to the last image in the presentation, Snowshoe Rabbit in Adirondacks 2009 by Marvin Dennis. Just as we started with an intimate portrait of an animal in a landscape, we end with one. It shows a snowshoe hare under a snowy tree limb, beckoning the viewer to imagine it hopping off into the distance and invites us to preserve the Adirondack scene for generations to come. Thank you for joining me on this art historical journey of the sporting art of the Adirondacks from the Adirondacks Experiences Collection. It's been a pleasure presenting to you. Thank you so much. And at this time, we're happy to take some questions. You can type your questions into the Q&A feature. Claudia, thank you so much. That was very interesting. You know, I've been here with the Adirondack experience for 25 years. And some of those pieces, I, I, I looking at them, I'm like, oh, wow, I've never seen that one before. And, and then, of course, some favorites. So that, that was um, wonderful. Thank you so much. So we did answer a few questions that did come up in the Q&A. If anyone else has some questions for Claudia, please put them well, I'm waiting for questions to come in. I want to tell you about our next artist and in inspiration program. Oh, pause. I've got a question. Oh, here we go. Claudia and Christine, do you paint as well? I am going to say that uh, I do not paint very well, although I did do that paint and stuff up there. Claudia, how about you? I realized that I was way too much of a tortured artist to continue by the time I was about 18 years old and started to enjoy other people's expression over that um, uncomfortable feeling of never feeling like I did it well enough. So no, I don't paint anymore. Thank you for that. Um, we, ha we have a question that says, will the show come to Middleburg? So that would be our paintings. And you did mention earlier that you have done exhibitions with our pieces in the past. Yes, we've taken loans before. I, I mean, it would, have, it would be an amazing opportunity to mount an exhibition surrounding the wonderful works that we were able to share uh, this evening, uh, but it is not officially an exhibition. Indeed. Uh, we got a question, are there uh, paintings available as prints in the shop? And yes, there are some, uh, definitely some prints um, in our museum store. You'll have to check that out and also check out online. We have a question here. Um, would you recommend any books on the subject? What books might you recommend? Oh, um, that was offhand, not on my radar. Um, let me pop some thoughts to you and maybe we can share that after the presentation. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. And we do have um, some pieces. I know, I'm not sure if it is still in print. We did have um, an interesting piece on Arthur Fitzwilliam Tate, but it may be out of print. So we'd have to check that on our, um, on our site. So please hold for some yeah. thoughts on that, but thank you for asking. I think um, you're thinking of Cadbury Marsh's catalog resume on Arthur Fitzwilliam Tate. Yeah, that is certainly for a really wonderful biography about Tate himself, his um, his entire um, journey from into the United States and really his decades long um, career as an artist, almost six decades worth, are wonderfully expanded on in that book that you're that you're that you mentioned. Absolutely. Uh, we have a question. Where can I find more information on Augustus Rockwell? And I'm not sure. I'm not sure if uh, are sure. Do you have an idea on that? Let's 
I don't know if there's a book about him specifically. He's certainly featured um, in landscape art history um, of the 19th century. Yes, indeed. Uh, um, we have someone talking about NSLN and what a wonderful institution and that everyone should visit. Oh, um, I like that comment a lot. <laughs> yes, asking you to give, um, to talk a little more about and give a plug for NSLM. So we have a fan in the in the audience. It's fantastic. Well, I'll I'll take the opportunity to make that plug then. <laughs> so the uh, National Sporting Library and Museum is located about 60 miles west of Washington, DC. And it is in the heart of hunting and horse country. Uh, we're surrounded by beautiful beautiful farms and uh, rolling hills. And if you range a little bit further west, you'll be at the Shenandoah National Park. So it's a really beautiful area in Virginia. Our institution focuses on preserving, promoting, and sharing the literature, art, and culture of equestrian, angling, and other field sports. So everything having to do with uh, equestrian activities, wing shooting, and fly fishing are gonna fall into our main, our main focus. Uh, the library was founded in 1954. We have a rare books collection that dates back to uh, 1523 as our earliest volume. And our, our collection holdings are about 1500 works. And uh, the museum's actually only 10 years old at this point. So I hope to see many of you folks out our way when you might find yourself vacationing in the area as well. Thank you for that. Um, someone's hoping to see um, portraits of sportsmen's guides and an Adirondack guide boat in our exhibition. So stay tuned. You will see those things. Absolutely. Um, here's a question. Do you think that painting as a medium for sports, for sports paintings, continue as a form? Or will it be replaced by photography, especially in the digital format? So painting as a, medi a medium for sports painting, will it continue as a form and might it be replaced for, by photography? That's a great question. So um, there was a very famous series of photographs that was taken by a photographer named Edward Moybridge uh, in the 1870s that looked at motion. And those photographs really revolutionized the way that artists depicted motion in particular. Until those photographs were done, um, there was a, a really, we did not have a good understanding of animal, human um, locomotion. And so we, th those photographs were created. Uh, it hasn't stopped sporting art or art in the 20th century, but certainly revolutionized the way that artists looked at motion, the way that we see motion today is directly reflected by those pictures. So um, in terms of sporting art in particular, definitely not a dying art form. There are plenty of um, contemporary artists today that we continue to feature in our museum um, as well, uh, looking to American subject matter and uh, European and um, British subject matter as well. Thank you. This is an interesting pondering I, I enjoy. Do we know who is pictured in a good time coming? My daughter has a theory that the man in the red vest and the man in the red hat are the same person. So that is not the case. Um, we do know who the sitters are. Let me get back to that in, um, that description in particular, if you can give me one moment. Absolutely. Uh, uh, let's see here. It, it, an interesting theory, and I, I do know that we, we do know the people who are depicted in, in, the, in the painting. So other than Tate, um, we also have a good friend of Tate's who is uh, John Osborne, and he was a liquor importer based out of Brooklyn who's featured. And then the other two were guides that were accompanied them on that, on that trip to his shanty. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then somebody wrote that Patricia Fitzgerald on Tate. I, I'm thinking that that perhaps is a book on, on Tate. Is there someone, Patricia, Patricia Fitzgerald, who wrote about Tate? Um, I'm not certain. And then 
here is a, a, an interesting question. Are there any contemporary artists still painting scenes like this? Yes, absolutely. Um, I don't want to leave anyone out. Uh, so I'll, I'll try and think of a few here. So in terms of painters, uh, uh, C.D. Clark would be someone who um, paints sporting scenes, specifically of the Adirondacks. I don't know that I can speak to that um, if there's a regional artist that you might know of, Christine, but there are certainly national sporting artists who who um, do this subject matter. I don't, uh, uh, but I'm sure that our curator, Laura, um, would know more of that, certainly. And here is another sort of in the same. Do you have more current work about outdoor sporting life? The last few paintings are fairly current, but hunting is a tricky matter these days. Right. I, the Adirondacks collection certainly does not represent um, 20th century um, sporting um, topics. We have had exhibitions. Um, other um, artists that come to mind, Peter Corbin is one who does sporting um, scenes, um, fishing and, and, and wing shooting. Um, let's see who else is a contemporary artist. There are others. Uh, someone commented that they were somewhat surprised that there was nothing on Win Winslow Homer, which we have a couple of pieces, but not so much to this subject. Right. I really did try to narrow it down to the sporting topic and to carry that thread forward. I, obviously, Homer did some amazing sporting scenes as well, um, but aren't represented in the Adirondacks collection in particular. Thank you. And we have a question, did Tate paint plein air or in a studio? He took studies from nature. So the, um, that setter um, sketch would have probably been something he would have done on the, on the spot, but certainly the large compositions, when you look to the paintings that are, you know, these 40 by 50 inch canvases, those are things that he would have really constructed and composed in a studio, studio under controlled circumstances and working on it for extended periods of time. Um, somebody asked, Claudia, can you give a preview of possible upcoming NSLM shows you are working on, please? Oh, I like that. So uh, we are, are, what I, particular what I'm working on, that's a couple years out, but I'll focus on things that are happening in the next couple years. We are excited to be a venue for an exhibition that will be coming to us from the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts called Romantic Bronzes. Uh, it was curated by their Paul Mellon curator, Sylvain Cordier, and focuses on uh, the bronzes of Antoine Louis Berry, who was uh, the, 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 fa the grandfather of uh, uh, Anna Maliere sculpture in France. And that exhibition was on view at VMFA and we'll be, we'll be featuring that in the spring. And then in the fall, we're excited to announce being a venue for survival of the fittest. It's an exhibition being coordinated by the National Museum of Wildlife Art with the Rights Museum and focuses on the big four animal artists of the 19th century. So we've got William Kuhnert, Carl Rongius, um, Carl Fries, and uh, Bruno Lillefors as icons of their time in painting these sweeping landscape, uh, landscapes of golden eagles and flight and uh, the, um, the, the Wyoming backcountry and these really dramatic animal scenes. So we're excited about that project as well. And another question about your museum, wondering if the sports museum also deals with sporting artifacts. We, our, our mission really an imperative collection management's policy and plan focuses on fine art. Um, we do have a few anomalies that came into the collection before the museum was opened. So um, you may be familiar with the, um, the sporting art collector philanthropist, um, Paul Mellon, who uh, donated his sporting art collection to both um, to um, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts and founded Yale Center for British Art, which is an encyclopedic approach to British art which includes um, sporting topics. We have um, a gift that his wife gave to him for his 80th birthday. So what does one give to a man who has been collecting sporting art, sporting objects, and it, um, has dedicated his entire life to, 
to uh, all things sportings for, for decades? The answer is a 1790s jockey scale. So we have a, a, a jockey scale from the 1790s. We also have his riding boots. Um, the library collections has um, prehistoric horse teeth is another anomaly that is in our in our holdings, but fun to talk about. So there are a few things along the way. Thank you. Um, a question, are there any works by A.B. Frost or Frank Benson at the Adirondack Experience? And I don't know if you've come across any of those. I don't know off the top of my head. I did not see any. I was looking for sporting art. Um, we have uh, two Frank Weston Benson paintings in our collection, uh, one of setting out in a sailboat and another um, that's a really dramatic um, um, fly fishing scene, an oil painting. And the second artist was Pleisner, did they say? A.B. Frost. A.B. Frost, sorry. Um, we we have a few prints by Frost in our collection. I wish we did have original work by him. He, these are also, again, two iconic sporting artists that would be very much part of the conversation in art, art history. Mm -hmm. Couple more questions. What other areas in the U.S. has painters using the areas for their paintings? I would think national parks would have been very popular. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Wyoming still today offers inspiration. I mentioned Carl Rungius before. And the really the 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 alluring aspect of the Adirondacks in the 1850s that it, was that it was still an excursion. It was pretty difficult to get to. The trains weren't there. This is really, you know, these were sporting people who um, were were envisioning a, an an adventure that would entail hiking, you know, for for quite some distance to these remote regions to experience the sport and um, to camp. And so another area like that was um, the Wyoming and Carl Rungius. I mentioned that from the Survival of the Fittest um, exhibition was a German artist who came to the United States to paint the backcountry of Wyoming as another example. And um, one more. As with Murray's book, did the popularity of recreating in the Adirondacks get a boost from Tate's paintings and others' paintings, other paintings? Absolutely. I think it's a self-perpetuating cycle. I mean, we see this really sort of American um, uh, passion for all things that were rugged and, you know, Western expansion had also gr a great impact on American art. And uh, so there was, there was the the desire for it and Tate's capability of creating it. And Courier Knives is a lithography firm that um, had the capacity to nationally distribute and market these, these prints of these paintings as well. So it's very much a part of the American experience and American art discussion. Wonderful. I think we've reached the end of our questions. Well, thank you so very much for this tonight, Claudia. Wonderful. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, tonight's uh, recording has a uh, uh, presentation has been recorded and should be up on our website uh, a little later this week. Our next artist and inspiration program will be on December 12th. And this special program will be a panel discussion on the status of artists in the Adirondacks, um, featuring several artists and art leaders across the region and will be moderated by NCPR's Mitch Tyke. Information on the program and the registration um, is posted in the chat. Oh, and we have lots of thank yous coming in for, for you, Claudia. Great session, um, excellent presentation, lots of things coming in. Um, and for those of you in the region who are looking for a spirited evening of libations, please check out our Cats and Trivia Takeovers at breweries throughout the Adirondacks. We'll be at the Sockendaga Brewing Company on December 9th and in Lake Placid on December 14th. Um, check out adkx.org, the uh, adkx.org events page for more information on that. And Everybody is saying wonderful presentation and thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful warm holiday season. Thank you, Claudia. You have a wonderful evening. Good night, everyone. Thank you again. Good night. Bye-bye.